Welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. It is the 17th of April, um, 2013, and um, we have invited Detroit Future Schools to be in the house, so to speak. Um, and uh, mm -hmm. so we will get around to a couple of those introductions. Uh, we, we were hoping an artist was going to join us, but she's not going to be able to join us. But we uh, have the director of Detroit, is that right, the correct word, director, coordinator? Coordinator. Coordinator, yeah, that's it. Of the uh, Detroit uh, Future Schools. And one of the teachers, Danielle, um, is with us as well. And we're going to get into that. But um, given what happened in, in Boston recently, um, it seemed to me that one of the things that we can do here on TTT is check in with each other and um, talk about sort of um, persistence and resilience that, um, that teaching allows us to do, if I can pose it that way. Um, and um, so I, Fred, who is in the Boston Writing Project, and Fred, you can say this yourself, Fred Haas. Um, and so we're going to have Fred just check in with us here at the beginning and just see how things are feeling to him. And you said something about your the town you're in is, is the beginning of the marathon? Is that right? Yeah, so I, I mean, I'm part of the Boston Writing Project, but I actually um, live and teach out in the suburbs. And I teach in Hopkinton, Massachusetts, which is where the Boston Marathon begins. So there's a big stripe. Uh, you know, a uh, starting line right there in the center of the town, and the high school and the middle school are next to one another, and they end up being the sort of um, initial check-in places and where they wrangle all the runners and then get them to the starting line, which is down in the center of town. Um, so, you know, needless to say, the, the marathon itself has a sort of special place and holds a, a certain spell over the city. Um, and, uh, so, you know, that, we're, fortunately, everybody I know is, was, you know, more involved at the beginning than anything. Um, so a lot of kids volunteer, a lot of students volunteer at the beginning, especially the track, um, students, track athletes, they'll volunteer at the beginning, and, um, you know, so it's 26 miles away from the bombs, yeah. but... Uh, it definitely I, is a big deal in the community. What do you mean, big deal? How's it? Well, I, you you know, you see the escalation of the preparations even before. Like right now, this week we're all on spring break up here. Um, so you haven't been back in school at all yet. No, no. Mm -hmm. And Monday is a state holiday as well. So even if we were in session, we wouldn't have had school. Um, but, there, you know, Tuesday didn't bring us all back together to sort of uh, reassure and reaffirm that everything's going to be okay or anything. So it is a little weird um, to not have that. And uh, I know some of my colleagues certainly um, were, like, you know, troubled, had a difficult time sleeping, things like that. Um, but there was no real big news from the school, so... You know, as far as that goes, you know, everything um, seems to be, uh, you know, moving positively, I guess. Um, but just to be in the area and everything, it is a little, I mean, the fact that it's vacation week and a lot of people leave town, um, you know, we have a whole pack of students in China and a whole pack of students in France right now from our school. So my guess is <clears throat> they found out about this all pretty well after the fact. Um, but it is definitely uh, odd that you know you don't you're, we're not in the regular routine at the moment. So um, it'll be interesting to see what happens on Monday. If I'm sure it'll come up, but I don't know how big a topic it'll be because I'm sure everybody you know I mean all the students I'm sure have been talking to one another about it. So mm -hmm. that's sort of where we are. Mm -hmm. Do you what grades again do you teach? I teach at the high school. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, the other thing, too, that I guess I would say that kind of makes the town, uh, the marathon, a real big and exciting time for the town is 
uh, just about every year, like a whole group of Kenyan runners um, do a program at one of the elementary schools, and there's this big sort of festivity on, you know, leading up early part of, or like the end of uh, last week, leading up into the to the marathon day. So that's pretty common, and um, you know, so it's a, it sort of takes over the town for about a five or six days before. Well, even in, in these scenes uh, where the bomb was, there were all these international flags all around. Yeah, time. yeah. Which, well, I mean, 27,000, or t no, what was it, 23,000 runners, and all from, I mean, they're from all over the place. So, I mean, it's definitely an international event. Um, and, and where the marathon ends, I don't know how many people have been in Boston, but it, it ends right sort of in the... Um, very close to sort of the heart of the city, about a few blocks away from Boston Common. And it's right by the uh, public library. It's a few blocks from where all the hotels are, um, including some hotels that, that are sort of in that vicinity. And just west of there is where Boston University and Northeastern University are, and um, the Prudential Center, which is, you know, one of the tall sort of iconic buildings in the skyline. So um, it's definitely a very dense area. It's in one block away is Newbury Street, which is where all the ritzy shopping is. So that whole area is is kind of um, pretty well where the action is, even when there's not a marathon. So Monica, welcome by the way, um, and uh, uh, from from Boston is just kind of letting us know how it's feeling. Um, near Boston is where he is. Um, one of the things that was written in Runner's World, uh, and I consider myself as humbly, I will say, uh, um, as a runner, and um, is, is that it's a challenge um, to the democracy of the streets, um, which I, I thought was a really interesting kind of thing to think about. Like, so if you're a runner, like, you're not going to tell me I can't be out there in the streets, you know? <laughs> so I, I kind of felt yeah. that phrase in some way. I, I mean, in a lot of ways, that's even, some of that's already even come out, like with the press conferences here um, with the authorities. You know, they've, they've, they've mentioned multiple times that there's no way that you can secure the whole place and you're, there's no way to turn it into some sort of military operation. You know, it's too many, too much mileage. It's it's open streets, um, and I mean, I'm sure security will be tightened next year, but it can only be tightened so much. You know, I mean, they're not. I they already have, um, you know, police motorcycles that run down back and forth along the route at various mm -hmm. times, and um, there's definitely police. You know, at sort of points along the route as well, um, but, you know, it is, it's a, it's a big, it's an open event, and it's a, sort of a rolling festival <laughs> in a lot of ways. Sure. Anybody else have any thoughts or questions or around this topic? And then we'll get, we will get to Detroit, I promise. <laughs> questions. I mean, Your thoughts. We're, it's, Danielle, go ahead. it's dangerous, right? Like sometimes these are like kind of dangerous topics to talk about, but sometimes those dangerous topics are the most important ones to investigate in classrooms, right? So, you know, terrorist acts, as, as this might have been deemed, even wrongfully so, have been going on in our country for as long as our country has existed, you know? And so I think it's interesting, I think uh, from a a teaching perspective, whether it's in Detroit or New York or even locally, looking at, you know, how it's being covered and the language that's being used and who's being criminalized and um, for students to pay attention to kind of how they're being positioned within this larger narrative. Um, I don't want to go too far into because I don't want to get into too dangerous of territory, but um, many of the conversations are um, in the lunchroom have been kind of along the lines of um, discussing just, you know, who's being held up in the media as potential suspects and 
you know, how that, um, how particular groups within our country are always under, sus are, are always suspects, right? And um, how that impacts our relationships with each other and um, our ability to be compassionate and to be able to be collaborative as opposed to just individualistic. So, you know, some of that's been, that's what we've been discussing a lot over here. I can't say everyone in New York, but I can't say my friends in the lunchroom. Um, that's that's a teacher's college you're talking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We 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 you know that was kind of the discussion that we started having. Like, you know, what is a terrorist? And you know, because some of the um, the film, some of the footage, and some of the things that are going on around Facebook and Twitter um, in terms of accusations are just really problematic. And then even like the president's language around like we are going to get this whoever did it, you know. And then it's like, well. And what? Who are you going to get? <laughs> you know, and let's say you do find whoever did this. And, you know, what's what's causing all of this? And what kinds of interactions are we having because of the way that you can talk about it, right? So um, that's what we've been talking about. Yeah. But prayer yeah, that, that feels dangerous, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Should I be talking about this? No, nah, I'm just teasing. <laughs> So, Fred, help us make the transition a little bit. Um, media, language, literacy in your classroom, you don't, you're not sure you'll be dealing with this issue? or Well, I, it, think, or, I think yeah. I will bring it up. I mean, I, I don't think there's really any question about that. Um, if for no other reason, I suppose, because sometimes I probably look for trouble. But... <laughs> Um, what, what do you mean by that? Because that's that's not insignificant. I, yeah. Um, well, I just, I mean, in some ways, I mean, I, I'm an English teacher, but um, I could have easily been a history teacher. And uh, I just think that, you know, we have a certain obligation to um, face up to the things that are uncomfortable and the things that maybe we don't like so much about how... Um, the world or the country operates or maybe um, I mean even sort of interrogating the kind of language that was used uh, because I mean I think it would I think it would be safe to say that it was definitely an act of terror um, but you know that that word has sort of been co-opted by this whole other you know um, propaganda machine and, and I'm not sure that it fits there uh, you know there's obviously I don't know how closely anybody's been following things, but you know, right away there was the um, and a, somebody from the Middle East who uh, you know his apartment was raided and things, and all the journalists descended on that. But um, you know, the, I think to the credit of the investigation and the officials, they've been um, very cautious here, at least about. Um, how they're approaching things, and there was a, even an earlier report today that you know they had found a suspect, but that was all rebuked. Um, so, but I mean, I think you just you have to like face up to some of this stuff, and you have to face up to the things that are are kind of ugly. Otherwise, how do you have a chance to really change them? Well. Um... <laughs> Fred, um, feel free to come or go or stay as long as you'd like. Um, love to have you on tonight, but I wanted to kind of shift to what we had already scheduled. And and I do have a, a relatively, I don't know what it is, maybe it's a clunky, clunky um, thought <laughs> about the transition, and that's that I'm from New York City, and like the feeling of city and Boston, and Christina's from Philadelphia, and um, you guys are from Detroit, mm -hmm. and Monica, I, I couldn't think of Loveland as a city, but city as school. <laughs> but maybe it is. I don't know. But um, but cer certainly there's 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 a sense of pride of city and what we are because of the city, in some way. So when whenever Detroit Future Schools came up, um, and I was introduced to you guys at uh, the DML conference recently. Um, Danielle, you a little bit earlier, but um, it, you know, 
you can't hear Detroit without thinking about the city, right, of Detroit and, and all the sort of uh, implications that go off in your head, at least I can. Um, both kind of scary ones, but also like real positive ones about potential for change and things. So I'm going to do that as, as the beginning of an introduction over to you. Amira Saadi, am I saying that correct? Saidi. Saidi, okay. Um, do you want to introduce yourself and bounce off of what anything you just heard there, and and we'll kind of progress from there. Is that sure. Right? Okay. Um, yeah. Welcome. So, <laughs> my name is Amir Saidi, uh, and I'm the program coordinator <laughs> for Detroit Future Schools. I've taught um, for seven years in the classroom as an English middle and high school teacher. Um, four or five of those years being in Detroit classrooms. Um, and I became the coordinator for Detroit Future Schools in 2011. I definitely can relate to Fred's notion of uh, getting into trouble in the classroom. Uh, really brought in a lot of what is happening in the world into my classroom um, and actually connected the first time I had heard of the National Writing Project, I used to Skype in people from all over the world to talk to my students. Every two weeks, um, if it was like a military person who was kicked out of the military for being um, gay, if it was somebody who had organized protests and skipped out on the Vietnam War, um, just to give to complicate what is usually black and white issues um, as we present them in school. Um, so I really appreciated um, what Brad had articulated, what he was going to do with the situation, and open up the dialogue. Um, and Danielle? So, uh, can I just emphasize or underline what you just said there? Because I think what you just said, and, and check back with you. Um, getting in trouble sounds like you're presenting <coughs> a position that, you know, gets you in trouble. But what you just said is you bring up the dialogue and, and, and try to show the grays of something which, you know, shouldn't be trouble, should it? Well, um, when you're in schools that value standardized testing, things shouldn't be gray. They should be black and white, A, B, C, or D. Mm -hmm. So um, any grayness that you enter into the classroom, um, if you don't somehow, like taking the time to have a Skype session with some, somebody across the world to an administrator walking in who's feeling pressure to get standardized test scores, if you're not showing an impact for like why this type of learning actually adds value to everything and indirectly you know, increases standardized test scores, then you'd get kicked out. So it's like you have a microscope, microscope on your classroom. And several DFS teachers talk about the same thing because we like to bring community into the classroom. That's great. Um, DFS, uh, Detroit Future Schools, um, is you were the founding coordinator, is that correct? Uh, it's been around a couple of years. Or I was on board when it was still an idea, but the, the idea actually came from the Detroit Digital Justice Coalition, um, which received a $1.8 million federal stimulus grant um, to pretty much close the, uh, what is it, the uh, something gap? Are you familiar? Digital? So, yeah, the digital divide. Well, the divide. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so. Okay. And how were they seeing that? I mean, what, what did they mean by digital divide? Yeah. Um, the digital divide uh, really never asked that question, but I think it was like <laughs> most simplistically it's the idea that people in the poorest communities don't have access to um, the Internet, which is becoming like the easiest mode of communication and the example that I've heard thrown around are like there are some stores or like chains that don't have paper applications anymore you have to apply online um, so that's the example that's like often th thrown around of why we need to close the digital divide that's mm -hmm. the dreams. it's almost like we're gonna get to a point where it's like if you can't write if you're illiterate in that sense then you have all these opportunities that are not available to you Danielle, do you want to introduce yourself a little more and then explain sure. how you fit with DFS? Well, um, so I grew up in Detroit, um, kindergarten through eighth grade, um, and then went to high school in the suburbs. Um, and I think that kind of planted a seed in my 
in my imagination when I saw just the gross inequity in what I had access to um, in both spaces, at least in terms of material wealth, right? Um, but not in terms of teachers. I had excellent teachers in Detroit. Um, and then I went on to become a teacher, and I taught for 10 years in Detroit and uh, came across Detroit Future Schools, you know, just through, you know, you, you're friends with people in the community, and I was a community organizer as well. And um, so when the idea was hatched and I met um, Amira, uh, DFS seemed like a really good fit. And so last year, <clears throat> um, in the inaugural year of DFS, I was paired with, um, a digital media artist by the name of Isaac Miller who came into my classroom once a week and uh, we kind of co-constructed this curriculum um, that would be intentionally linked to transformation of the self and transformation of community. So these digital media projects were tied to my 11th grade English classroom um, and what we were doing in terms of the curriculum but also was heavily tied to what was happening in the community. Um, and then from there, um, I applied to um, grad school, and here I am this year at Teachers College, um, pursuing my PhD in English education, but still very much in contact with. Um, Can't take uh, Detroit out of the out of the. Group. I can't. It's I'm reading books right now about busing. Like I can't get in. You know, can I? Anytime I have a chance, like I want to learn more about what's happened and what is happening. Um, in Detroit, because like you mentioned in the beginning, I think you can't think, you know, when you hear Detroit, you can't help but think about, you know, city and what it means to be a city and what it means specifically to be a post-industrial city that's been deemed as dying, right? Um, and so I think DFS is part of a larger effort of many groups of people who are trying to really rethink, like, what it means to rebuild a city and what it means to rebuild a city in a humane way and a participatory way. Um, that serves, you know, the individual and collective interests of those who are there. Um, so that's kind of my, that's my elevator speech. So some of that curriculum that you just talk, talked about is on Digital Is, um, um, I, and I'm not sure I got the link correct, but um, maybe you yeah. can put the correct link Maybe in. I can add it in. Okay, good. Either on the Titan Pad or in the chat. Yeah, I think actually I created some notes. This is my first time doing this kind of thing. <laughs> okay. So um, I can add that in. But I do have actually something that I think would be really um, helpful is um, where is it? I need a screen share. And we do have, I, I promised, uh, we do have a, a five to ten minute um, okay. introduction of everything okay. coming up. But yeah, we can do that. Um, Monica, uh, Amira is in IDEA. Uh, is that right? Uh, all right. Uh, Amira, I, um, one, of the, one of your blog posts I saw, I think you, were, you took a tour of New York City um, mm -hmm. recently. Um, and it, that was with IDEA, IDEA? Yeah, we, we, I did a tour last year with IDEA, but we also did another NYC tour as DFS this year. Oh, you did? OK, yeah. great. So you were when you were at the point, you could have thrown a stone and hit my school, but so anyway, just to say, <laughs> and some people do. No, <laughs> um, but uh, so that's very cool. Um, Monica, you have any questions or thoughts as we get started here, and then we'll throw it to Amira and and Christina. If you could give us maybe some context um, as well, that would be great, and then we'll. Turn it to Amir, and she'll do a more detailed introduction of what um, DFS is all about. I'll just add. I'm just really excited to be here. Um, I'm uh, working with um, organizing IDEC, Amira. So, okay. and have had several conversations lately um, with people with efforts in Detroit. Um, so that's been heavy on my mind as well. And um, so. Looking forward to this um, learning from you guys. Um, I would just echo what uh, Monica said there, that I'm really excited to uh, connect with you guys here and continue to learn from you. Um, and um, just to situate things um, in some way, I think this is what you're asking for, Paul. Well, um, we never introduced you, Christine. Sorry. Oh, <laughs> true. Yeah, OK. Yeah, go ahead. 
<laughs> so um, my name is Christina Cantrell, and I work for the National Writing Project. Um, I often say it's my great honor to work for the Writing Project, and I think that's really true because I get to connect with these um, very thoughtful educators um, and learn from you all. And um, uh, I uh, co-direct our Digital Is project. So um, Digital Is um, is funded by the MacArthur Foundation and supports our work in digital media and learning, um, work that teachers in the Writing Project have been doing for a very long time and developing and iterating as they go. The Digital Is website is sort of one of the um, public manifestations of that right now, um, where you can see Danielle's work, um, the work that she is describing. And what's been really exciting recently is that um, Danielle's, Danielle described this project that she did with um, her uh, teaching artist partner the, that they co-constructed um, in their classroom and now um, pre-service teachers have been from various a couple of universities are have been looking at that work and talking to Danielle about her work and asking her questions um, and then Danielle herself has also been reflecting on the questions that they've been asking her so Danielle can talk more about that but it's been a really exciting process to watch um, uh, unfold in really interesting conversations mm -hmm. um, and then just on the side of, um, uh, quickly, I'm, um, I am from Philly, and I'm um, born and raised and went to public schools here, and um, am also really committed to um, uh, supporting, a, you know, a humane and participatory environment. So mm -hmm. I greatly um, appreciate the work that I've um, seen so far coming out of Detroit future schools and the related networks that you work with um, and I'm really interested to learn more about how um, how this work is unfolding so thank you cool. thanks so much um, Chris you just arrived Chris Sang um, another colleague from Boston uh, or nearby um, and <laughs> I promise. The next, just take a couple of minutes to check in with you and see how <coughs> you're taking in what happened on Monday. Welcome. Introduce yourself a bit, if you would. Whoop, we don't hear you yet. You got to unmute. The new thing on Google Plus, unmute. <laughs> uh, yep, try again. Not working. Um, well, we don't hear you still. Um, anybody have a suggestion? <laughs> I had to X out and then join again. Uh -huh. Yeah, sometimes it does work. So, Chris, why don't you go out and come back again, and we'll see what happens. Okay, so, <laughs> Amir, why don't you go ahead? Um, Amir has this uh, wonderful Prezi, um, and we think we can show it. Um, so she's going to share a screen here to introduce more about um, Detroit <coughs> Future Schools. And okay, um, so this is a super short Prezi, uh, uh -huh. or the portion of the Prezi, so if everyone wants we don't, to do the future. You're you going there still. What, what we see is another screen. You need to choose another one. We see... Chris, did it work yet? Uh, can you hear me? We can. Yeah. Oh, so, great. Hi, so, Chris. We'll go there. Chris, um, introduce yourself a bit and then say what's on your mind briefly as Amira finds the right screen there. All right. Hey, Paul. This is uh, Chris Singh out from uh, Boston Writing Project out here in Boston. And, um, you know, definitely yesterday was a very surreal moment. Definitely felt a lot like 9-11 um, in terms of, you know, my dad was in, involved in being in the Pentagon at that moment. Mm. So, you know, you definitely remember where you were and what, what happened. So I was in the bowling alley, you know, seeing some of that news footage. And, uh, you know, it definitely felt unreal. I wasn't sure whether it was actually happening. And then um, just talking with some other people, it was just, it definitely 
was quite shocking. And then, you know, I realized that people were wondering how I was doing, which, uh, you know, surprised me. Um, but of course, people didn't know where I was. So it was really important to mm. Facebook out and text people and let them know what, how things were going. Um, actually, the uh, eight-year-old boy who was killed in, in the blast, in the explosions, uh, is went to school in, um, in the school that we partner with. So it was definitely very sad. I definitely uh, emailed a colleague over there and, and let her know that, you know, we're definitely with her in, in terms of our thoughts and prayers. But uh, it definitely touched home over here. Mm -hmm. It did make me think a little bit about that, you know, this is, is a good time for the writing project and the time to, to write about what's going on. Hmm. You know, um, what, one, of the, uh, you know, one of the first times I thought about that um, was, was around in New Orleans. And, um, you know, so sometimes there are stories that just can't be told yet, too, mm. when things like this happen. You know? um, so I wonder what's... You know how that'll play out too. Whether well, everybody will be ready to or want to talk about things right away. Yeah, definitely. People are looking to connect with each other at this time here, out here in Boston. So, and that's a good thing. There, you know, I actually, I mean, one of the reasons why I said I know I'll end up bringing it up when we get back to school is I've I've actually been collecting little bits and pieces of stuff that um, I think is particularly powerful and. Speaking to what happened, and I and I'll probably um, share a couple of things um, with students, and and then give them the option, you know. Yep. I don't know if you guys read the Lahane piece in the New York Times today, but that that was pretty strong. Strong, and I didn't get the read yet. Well, he, you know, he just uh, I think I think he captured a mood. At, um, in a lot of ways, because uh, I, the title was, you know, um, they messed with the wrong city, but he sort of made a point of saying that that wasn't really about, like, you know, surging machismo or anything. It was just that, you know, if, if, if anybody thinks that this is going to really make everybody sort of, you know, afraid and, and not do what they normally do or whatever, that's just not going to happen. <laughs> Back and forth here a little bit. Amira, did you figure out what, what screen you need to go to? Or? Yeah, I'm pressing screen share and yeah. then I'm yeah. switching over so you guys should there be able to see it. Wait, one of them was good. <laughs> there we go. Oh, so can everybody see that? <coughs> or do you need to press screen share too? <coughs> I'm sorry. We can say, give me a thumbs up. Can you see the DFS on your screen? You yeah, can. Okay, good, good. You have to, if you click on the ribbon down at the bottom, too, it'll. Oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah, click on Amira's. That's, that's what you have to do. Thank you. So, Amira, we've got it. Go for it. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Um, so, DFS, um, our theory of change is about shifting uh, participants from consumers to producers. Um, and the way technology is typically um, being used or being taught to be used is monodirectional, so it's not really like a give and take, um, and that's what we want to flip. Uh, we want to give purpose to the um, media that we integrate into the classroom. So our vision is in creating a network, um, and the vision goes like this. Detroit Future Schools is a network of students, teachers, digital media artists, reinventing the purpose and practice of education in Detroit. DFS defines the purpose of education as a process of preparing youth, adults, youth and adults to envision and actualize a more. Did everyone scream? Yeah, we got it. A more, yeah, it just changed. A more just creative world. So, so. Mm -hmm. Just creative and collaborative world. So I have no idea what just happened. Um, <laughs> it went from uh, it went into the edit mode. Okay, so um, the takeaway from that scene would pretty much be um, that 
the Just Creative and Collaborative. Everything we try to do, we do across the Just Create. Is it just? Is it creative? Is it collaborative? And what does that really mean? And then additionally, um, it's the idea that we don't want to just change the students, but we want to also change adults. Um, and we want to create an intergenerational culture of transformation towards um, the cre create the justice, the creativity, and the collaboration um, that we want to see in the world. Amir, could I mess with you a little bit? Yeah. <laughs> and and say and and others feel free to do, to do this interruption too. Um, can, can you give me an example of a project that wasn't just? A project that wasn't just? Yeah. I mean, you said you checked just creative and, and collaborative. And I'm just curious about what justice looks like a little bit. Maybe give a positive example, I don't know. But. It's not so much the projects, because the projects are like created months in advance, um, but it is like things that happen in the classroom. Hmm. So for instance, um, you know, something might happen, like a student might be getting bullied, or um, maybe the teacher is feeling bullied by the students, so they'll have conversations around like, is this fair? Is this like what we're trying to? Is this the just world that we're trying to cultivate? Um, so, and then we'll talk more about the eleven essential traits. That's the actual language that they use in the classroom. Like, is this building the empathy and solidarity that we're trying to see that we've discussed in our lessons, etc. Cool. All right, go ahead. <laughs> um, so through community media production, which is uh, you know talking about the actual process, so building as part of a group, but then also going out into the community and bringing that into the classroom, um, you synthesize diverse experiences, you analyze deep-rooted problems, and you generate collective solutions. Um, and those that top row is Bloom's taxonomy, so higher order thinking skills, or um, as schools like to call them, 21st century skills. In BFS, we call them basic human skills. Um, and we really stress this idea that we're not reinventing anything. We're just like, um, what's the word? Bring it. And Danielle, feel free to like interject at any point. But it's like bringing us back to our own humanity. What we're born with. We're born with curiosity. We're born trying to be good people. Um, the structure of DFS. We integrate these four critical elements: the community, school interactions, um, critical pedagogy, digital media, arts integration, and doc and eval. Um, and with the doc and eval piece, this is a really strong example of actually all four of those critical elements. This is one of our DFS fifth grade classrooms. And what's happening is that there's a fishbowl happening. So that's you'll see the students in the center are having a conversation. And the, the, the statement or the question that they're analyzing is, when you see something unjust, is it all right to just take a picture? Or should you have to intervene? Um, and they've analyzed like famous Pulitzer Prize winning photos of like um, somebody getting the famous photo of the man getting shot. I forget what country it was. Um, the photo of the starving child um, in Africa with a vulture in the background. So they're analyzing, you know, these people who have captured really powerful images of injustice in the world. Um, but they didn't do anything to stop the injustice, but they did get the word out that this injustice is happening. So that's what they're discussing in this fifth grade, fifth grade classroom. Can, um, can, um, yeah. ama amazing, amazing photograph. Wow. Um, yeah. I mean, you, you could certainly do, you know, a, a Frarian kind of look at that photograph and just ask people to, to talk about what they see there and what kinds of themes come up. It's it's an amazing photograph. So, and, and if you're listening to this on your on your bike or on your run and in a podcast, you got to go back and and see the video so you can get to see this. But anyway, go ahead. Yeah. Which photo are you talking? Are you talking about one of the Pulitzer Prize winning ones? Or this? no, no, your photograph. <laughs> I mean, oh, okay. that's what's funny. You're talking about analyzing photographs, but this Any photograph idea. itself. The, the, the amount of attention and engagement in very different ways mm -hmm. in, in different parts of the classroom, it's just, uh, it's a pretty amazing photograph. Yeah, and uh, what you have is the students, the students on the inside are discussing it. You have a student who's documenting it using the teacher's phone, which is then uploaded and analyzed. And then you have students on the outside who are taught to transcribe as part of the doc and eval skill set that we teach. And then you have the teacher who's live transcribing and it's being projected on the smart board. So there are like 101 different levels of uh, documentation and evaluation happening there. Um, 
Next, we have the artist and teacher uh, partnership. Like this is the actual structure of the partnerships. The artist is responsible for um, producing two major media projects with the students um, and bringing in the digital media. So, um, now, can you break down who the are you signed out again? Can you uh, uh, can you do th yeah the artists? What kind of artists are they? They're media artists, but can you kind of list? Yeah. Specific, we are not, we don't take like fine, fine arts artists. We, it's digital media and they include web graphics, video, web video graphics. Audio. And audio. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and they're taught through Detroit Future Media, which is another of the Detroit, there are three Detroit Future programs that mm -hmm. are, that were launched under the stimulus grant. Um, and DFM teaches them in those four different mediums. Does that answer your question? I, yeah, I think so. Yep. Go ahead. <laughs> and then the teacher is responsible for um, making sure that they, she, he or she integrates the big question into the content of the classroom. And that's where I also come in to support to make sure that there is a tight connection. We um, don't want DFS or the digital media to be integrated just to be integrated. We want it to make the learning better and to make it richer and more dynamic. Um, and they're all, all of us within the DFS network are responsible for building a critically conscious and collaborative culture in the classroom. Um, so, Danielle, would this be a good place to jump in and talk about your relationship with your media um, artist? Or? Yeah, I just, I think it would be, I think it would be good for Amira to kind of finish okay. what she's going through <laughs> and then I can reference it, you know, yeah, in like two minutes, I think. Go ahead, Amira. Um, yeah, so, I mean, there's only, like, a, three more things going through, but um, the teachers and the artists during the summer retreat we have um, before we kick off another year of DFS, they have to complete what's called a RIDA framework, and it comes from the article by Duncan Andrade, Gangsta Wingsta RIDA, um, and it's the idea that we do want RIDAs in the classroom. We want people who are willing to ride or die for their students, um, not literally, but figuratively speaking. Um, they move through identifying like a collective purpose, a set of principles that are going to ground their classroom skills, practices, and then you'll notice that content is at the end. Like that's the last, one of the last things that we actually look at. Um, and we believe skills transfer, whereas content isn't like, we treat it as if it's static, but it's super fluid. Um, and teachers have said like they hadn't gone through a process like that, so it's really important for them um, to really think through what is their purpose, what are they actually trying to achieve in their classroom, and we help them, we facilitate them through that process. And we're talking about you you working with about a dozen teachers each summer? Yeah, a dozen teachers and six to eight artists. Okay. Um, this is a sample of the transcripts that are documented um, both by me and by teachers and by the artists in the classroom. Uh, we also collect video and photos that are hyperlinked into the transcript for a more objective documentation of what's happening. The teachers analyze their transcripts and then they receive what's called an 11 essential traits rubric. So it looks like this is just one section of it. In the 11 essential traits, we give them a Likert score and then we also have anecdotal data that supports the Likert score. And then the real money is in the last col column. These are the transformative. Yeah, go ahead. I didn't understand that. What you give them a what score? <laughs> a Likert score. Okay. So it's like yeah. a, a one means that it wasn't present, or a four means it was oh. like had to be present in the classroom. Got it. Got it. Got it. Um, now these okay. these eleven essential qualities traits traits. traits. Yeah. Uh, these are created by um, DFS or the district, or how do they? Where do they come um, from? It's really an amalgamation of several things. They came, from, they're research based, first of all, from my years of teaching and the other teachers that we had partnered with early on. And then we also did a collective brainstorm of like, what does engagement look like in the brainstorm at the, uh, what does engagement look like in the classroom at the first AMP camp that we did with uh, DFS back in 2011. Um, and that really informed what became the 11 essential traits. So it, it was a whole process. Would you mind reading, again, there are some people who are just going to listen to this, but so just reading what's in the blue, the, the single words, that might, is, we'll yes. get a level, yeah. So in the teal boxes yeah. um, are the 11 essential traits, so like optimism and hope, grit, um, amongst them are critical consciousness, empathy, solidarity, 
um, innovation, uh, observation. So those, I mean, I won't list all 11. But then when you have like the 11 essential traits, the first column identif like gives a definition. So there's a belief that the pe best possible outcome is attainable. That's the way we define optimism and hope. Um, and then mm -hmm. the middle column is the anecdotes that are pulled from the transcripts to support the score that the teacher has received, or the classroom rather, not the teacher. Um, and then the final column are all the instruct effective instructional practices that have resulted in the score. Um, so if it was a low score, what you'll notice is that there's advice given to the teacher. So for example, the teacher received a one in grit. So what I have written to the teachers, two teachers you may want to contact since they are strong in developing grit and students are Khadija and Ashley. Here are two videos from their classrooms. So we're actually virtually connecting the teachers um, through digital media uh, into like affecting their professional development. Um, and that's all that I'd want to show from the Prezi. Um, there, the rest that I was going to show are media projects, but I'll leave it to Danielle to talk about the work. Thank you for that introduction. Um, I, I, folks, please um, add your question thoughts um, as we go here. But Danielle, I guess it was thrown to you. I guess so. <laughs> Um, I'll try to do it justice. Um, so let me um, do the screen share and see if this works. I pressed it. Whoa. And then you choose one. Oh, awesome. Okay, sorry. I'm like excited. I've never done this. <laughs> so, um, because I want to be able to scroll through, so I'm going to pick this one. Is that right? Yeah, well. But I, wanted, I want you to see this. You picked the you wrong. See? There you Somebody. go. That's good, yeah. So, you know, luckily, so, um, so I had um, gone to Digital Is as a teacher before and kind of documented my year and I included the link and then um, I decided to be much more intentional this past year about documenting what happened um, and it's been a really excellent place for me to kind of make sense of my own practice and to document it and share and as you'll see and I can talk about later on um, it's been really useful to the student teachers that I've been working with and that other um, other teacher educators have been working with because it's you know it's evidence of this kind of work and it helps link theory to practice in a really really useful way but um so I wrote up this resource, and if you see this picture right here, again, right, I, similar to Amira, you have, like, community members who were coming in to demonstrate this participatory action research um, work that they had done at a youth center, and you have um, a hip-hop artist, Alana Invincible, to the right, who's recording the presenters, and then you have the artist who's on his computer, Isaac Miller, who um, I collaborated with all year, kind of watching this presentation getting ready to happen and then students paying attention. So you can kind of see this like ongoing thread of collaboration. Um, so I'm scrolling down to like what this looked like in the beginning at AMP camp and um, you know we did a lot of activities but one of the most useful activities was like thinking about what our essential questions would be given the values of the program, right? And so um, the Isaac and I decided that a really important question, if we were going to kind of use this problem-posing pedagogy model, um, was to think about kind of, you know, what does it mean to be a human being given that we right now are in a very dehumanizing environment, right? So what can we do in the classroom to really think about, you know, what it means to be human, what it means to be treated inhumanely, and to think about kind of how, you know, humanity or um, how to problematize that within text that were at hand as well in the curriculum. So this was kind of our brainstorm. Um, Danielle, but, not not to interrupt too much, but um, mm -hmm. the uh, your question and and what happened in Boston it can't be kind of <gasps> neglected, right? I, I mean, and and I've been impressed by somebody who was saying that the people who ran toward the blasts. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're, uh, somebody said we're doing what humans do. 
Right. Right. Which is such an interesting phrase. Like mm -hmm. uh, that's what humans do. Yeah. And obviously the bla the blast is very, you know, inhuman in some way. But right. Right. Yeah. And we I think given even expect and I was talking earlier about how we're positioned by media and, and other texts that surround us that are owned by corporations kind of position us in a way to be really individualistic. And so do classroom often, the classrooms oftentimes, right? Individual desks, sit in rows, take this test, fill in the bubble, right? But that's, you know, that's not exactly how we operate as evidenced by, you know, people's response in that marathon, right? It's, we are, we love and we care. <laughs> Pardon me? Nope, nope. Okay. Amira was just moving around there. Go ahead. Okay. So, <laughs> so... Worry. So here we were, right, we, thinking about this. And so what we decided to do is, um, you know, our coming, I, I'm focusing on this a lot um, because I think that one of the most important um, aspects of the program is thinking about developing really, um, really strong questions um, because that kind of leads the entire year. What are you investigating, <laughs> right? And so... We had three essential questions that we continued to return to um, throughout the year that related to what we thought was um, important if you're going to be considered um, a human being. Um, we thought about our relationship with language and power. We thought about um, the role that education plays in the health of the community. And then also our sense of agency, like using our literacy practice, practice to rewrite or change our world. So if you're denied the ability to have a powerful relationship with your language or multiple languages, if you're denied, you know, an education that's affirming, if you're denied the opportunity to have agency or to use your literacy practices to rethink what's around you, then you're not having, you're being denied of full, the full experience of, a, of being a human being. So that was the thinking behind that. And then from there, um, can you see this curriculum map? Or do I have to pick uh, no, not yet. No. Nope. All right. So, how would I? I don't want to do that. You what know do what? you want? Okay. So, um, what we sat down. You see the curriculum? Yes, intentional curriculum. Yep. Yeah. So, what was created was kind of this really intentional curriculum where. You know, how, because something that teachers, I think, struggle with sometimes is how do I take these ideas and merge them with, you know, the traditional texts that I quote unquote have to teach and also with the curriculum that's at hand. So, what we did was we designed this curriculum that forced students to think about themselves individually and by the end of the year reach this point of transformation. So, it was intentionally transformative in nature. So, we had four themes think, create, resist, and transform paired with, as you can see, these texts that high schoolers oftentimes read. And they were paired with media projects. So the students were reflecting on these traditional texts um, through the lens of a particular theme, but they were also asked to construct these really powerful media projects, which is what I'm going to show you now, just an example of a few. And then maybe we can get into um, some questions. Mm -hmm. So can, are we back? Uh, we see you. Well, that's Still. great. It's not bad. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, You're close. There you go. There we go. So, um, we're on digital ways again. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. You see it? Yep. Yeah. So initially in the beginning project, um, when, when students were thinking about kind of these questions, right, like asking a student what's the relationship between language and power and how does that manifest itself in your life, at first students are like, what are you asking me? <laughs> I have no idea what you're asking me. But I think that's part of, the pro part of the program is to challenge students in multiple ways, right, and getting them to take these complex questions and really break them down and be able to have, have them apply that to the curriculum that's in front of them, but also to their own lives and community. And so what students were instructed to do is we brought in a, a, green, a green screen. And um, the digital media artist, Isaac Miller, took students through a set of workshops using GIMP so they could create backgrounds for these images. And what we did was we said, 
you know, how do, how do you see yourself inside of this question? We want you to pose in front of this green screen and, you know, anticipating that you're going to create a background. And so that's what they did, right? And so you have, um, I'll go down here, you have a, the question, what role does education play in the health of a community? And you have a student to the left who sh you can see all of these adverse statements, right, that she hears about what it means, you know, to be um, a public high school student in Detroit, right? And here she is as an active resistance covering her ears. Um, you have a student to the left who, like, standardized test scores said that this girl was at, like, a second grade reading level or, you know, second, third grade reading level, but she clearly has an understanding of, like, um, how to use language in powerful ways, right? So the standardized test does not measure her true ability. She constructs a statement like, my image demonstrates a sense of failure or when some people try to use language and power within them. I chose to construct my picture this way because when we are confronted by our failures, we prefer to avoid them and just keep on living as we have. I see myself overcoming my sense of failure by keeping confidence in myself despite the feeling of failure and setting goals to develop strategies that will motivate me to succeed in life. And when you're trying to use language to create power with, within you, it, it inspires other people to succeed. And so you see through this individual act of creating these images, and then we, brought, we, we came together as a class and analyzed them. Students started to really understand the relationship with these questions, and they were able to apply it to texts like Night and Things Fall Apart. The second thing we did, um, <clears throat> which is the last resource I'll share with you, is we did this um, exchange with students in South Korea. And I'll share this um, with you if you'd like, or you can look at it later. Let's do that. For you can try. Time. Okay. You want to see it? It's a minute long? Yeah, let's do it. Let's see what happens. It's longer than me. It may not play. Um, it may, though. Where'd it go? Can you hear it? I breathe. Yes. Green tree that leads to the place that we need to be to get away from poverty we see daily. Let's go with you. Remember me out with you. Oh, okay. Sure. Um, Danielle, are we supposed to be seeing video too? There we go. Better. Leave it like that, yeah. Oh. Go ahead. Okay, so yeah, um, so we can get to some some questions. Go ahead. Right. Yeah. yeah. Can we do that? Yeah, sure. I have two, but I, I want to allow other people to jump in. Questions for Danielle or Amira? Am I back on the screen? Or thoughts? Not yet. There you are. <laughs> I'm back? Okay. That was pretty good, by the way. That, that's tough doing all that. <laughs> Thanks. No, it's good. It's good. <laughs> thoughts or questions? Oh, I'll start. Uh, <laughs> go ahead, good, go ahead, Christina. Go ahead. Uh, well, I just was. It's more a thought, or it just I. I want to that idea of seeing themselves in the question was sort of a <coughs> interesting. I mean, it was it the the student work is so provocative in that way, and so I appreciated you describing it that way too. I think that was that's an, a beautiful way to look at it and to to think about what the students are doing there and. I think it, it comes off that way too. It's pretty powerful. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Paul. So, so one, <laughs> uh, and um, one of the, one of the one. So, so I have two two different directions sort of to go. One is one is um, room for student um, self directed sort of agency in in some of those curricular questions. Is there room for some of that, or have you thought about how that fits? That... Are you talking to me? I, I, yeah, I am. 
Okay, so you're asking if there's room for agency. Can you d define what you well, mean? By well, I don't mean by agency. I mean like choosing. Like I don't like that question. I want to do something else. Yeah, I mean they chose. <clears throat> they got to choose which question that they wanted to address, mm -hmm. and um, most of them did not resist, right? Because as we started, ha you know, engaging these questions about like what it means to be a human being, right? Um, they started really thinking, like, I really have something to say about this because, uh -huh. you know, I don't feel like my, la my multiple languages are valued or I don't feel like, you know, I'm in an education system that's, you know, contributing to the health of my community, right? So many of them had different, and that's four out of, like, 160 images, you know, and they, they were all over the place, right? Um, yeah. But, yeah, I think in that sense there was... And by the way, people can go on to Digital Wiz and find this work and, mm -hmm. and comment on it there. Is that correct? Easily said. Is that correct, Christina? Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay, good. Um, you, you have to register to comment. and but, you um, Yeah, but once you join, then you can add mm -hmm. comments and add your own posts too. Okay. Um, the other question goes in a different direction, but it brings us back to Boston. And and one of the one of the um, and feel free anybody to jump in on this. But one of the ways that I've learned um, to to kind of evaluate my own curriculum is when something happens in the world, um, can you drop the content of what you're doing and still achieve the goals of of what you're trying to get the kids to learn, right? Um, which is kind of a Maybe a funny thought, but but it but that's always been interesting to me. It's not that you're and, and you want to not be a, an ambulance, you know, chaser necessarily going to the next disaster kind of thing. But if if your goals are, I think, Amira, you were very pretty clear earlier on. If they're if they're about skills and and you know agency and and that kind of stuff. Then the content matters, but when some when something like the Boston bombing happens, you know, saying, "Look, we're going to put aside night for the next two weeks because we have this other thing to work on," um, kind of gets to the same point. So, do you think there's room for that in the curriculum, and do you think about it like that? <laughs> that was a long-winded question. Sorry. Do whatever you want to with that. <laughs> Go ahead, Amira. Do you want to address that? <laughs> yeah. Um... I do a workshop with teachers where I give them like a totally, they would be totally unfamiliar with it. For instance, I gave them the Arabic alphabet. And then I have every teacher, before I give them the material, I have them write um, on a slips of paper one skill and one principle, and then we throw it into a hat. And then I give them the content, and then I tell them, now you have to randomly select a skill and a principle, and now you have to teach this content in order to gain this skill and principle. Um, and what that workshop like lends itself to is the idea that I really truly believe the content doesn't matter. It's um, whatever you're bringing into the space, um, the, the skills are what transfer into the world. And that's actually what we try to achieve in DFS is the idea it's we don't want to just change the students and ourselves in the classroom we better see that change outside of the classroom and in the world. Um, and we want to see it manifested in every decision that we're trying to make. Um, and, I mean, when the workshop is over, the teachers are just blown away. It, it takes them 10 nice. minutes to realize that the content really has no, you know, influence in the direction that you can take it. Mm -hmm. And that when the principal comes in and sees you Skyping with somebody, you, the example you gave earlier, um, that principal's not understanding that, right? Because that principal thinks what you're Skyping about is your content, and it's not in some way. So well, she, yeah, I mean, that principal, I mean, these principals in general, it's like I lump them into one thing, that you either have the vision-aligned administrator or you have the non-vision-aligned. They're really short-sighted. They're looking at things year-to-year, month-to-month. Um, and I've only had really two administrators that I thought are really far-sighted, like they had foresight. Um, so, was there a question in there? 
I don't know. We're wrapping up here. <laughs> we yeah. need to finish. Um, I did have one question to hopefully give you a chance to have last word here, um, which is, which is, um, how are things changing for DFS? How's how's it changing? How's this summer going to be different than the last couple of summers? Um, I can say that uh, for DFS, seeing the impact of our work, we've only been in operation for two years. Um, and we're not even like done with our second year. Um, and we already have trends that are coming out, like impacting standardized test scores, even though we're not teaching to the standardized test. We already have classroom culture and classroom management, which I call the philosopher's stone. If you can teach a teacher how to manage a classroom, like so many other doors and windows and opportunities um, come open. And we've had teachers who are explicitly stating it's because of we're integrating DFS practices and principles that we're able to impact the culture and therefore um, change the direction of the classroom. Um, so it's just getting clarity. We talk a lot about a fog being lifted from this really enigmatic thing called teaching that happens so quickly with so many moving parts. We're slowing things down. We're really being, we're really able to unpack things, document them, and evaluate them. Um, and I do, I want to leave space for Danielle. I mean, we're definitely in that type of headspace of like, what is it that we're doing, and how can we share it so that it's actually um, understandable to people who aren't immediately in our network. Well, thanks for sharing here tonight, Danielle. The yeah, I just wanted to wrap it up by saying, you know, these were very similar questions. I taught a class tonight, and, and lately um, students in my class, I'm teaching student teachers right now at Teachers College, and they've been engaging with the Digital Is website and thinking a lot about, you know, they're, they're like, help us link theory to practice. Like, what does it mean to have empathy? What does it mean to have a democratic space? What does it mean to have students civically engaged, right? And if we're not documenting kind of the processes that are happening that lead to this transformative kind of teaching and we're not sharing the work through something like digital is or if we don't have models that help us make sense of it, like connected learning, then this information just kind of stays in Detroit and in classrooms. And that's okay, right? I mean, transforming your city is important at a local level. But if this work if, if, is not distributed to people who are coming into the field, and forcing that, their hand in terms of thinking, like, is this, what does it mean, you know, to read and write? And what does it mean to read and write yourself into existence? You know, then we're not changing the field at all. It's not becoming more humane, right? So I think that's something that's really powerful about Detroit Teacher Schools is that they're, they're documenting it in a way that I think hasn't been documented before. Because they are, not only have these principles, they're evaluating the presence of these transformative principles and they're sharing the work you know in ways that are really significant so I just like to end on that note because I think a lot of people are doing this kind of work but if we're not publishing and I don't mean publishing like writing a book <laughs> I mean like publishing in ways that people can access the work um, then this, a lot of this stuff just happens inside of a box. So I, I just kind of wanted to plug that a little bit. Um, and the website and now, where this work is, is? Digital right, is, yes. Right, right now for me it's digital is. It seems right. to be one of the only places um, that I've been able to feel like I can publish and share with a, with a larger audience. Hopefully some of that um, will change. But I also think, um, I think did, um, DFS is a really awesome website too. That it's dfs.org, is it, or yeah. what is it? Is that right? Schools.DetroitFuture.org. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. And I believe in the future that Detroit Future will also be trying to um, share some of their findings in terms of trends that they're seeing happening so that it can be accessible to the larger community as well. So. All right. I feel like we're rushing here at the end, so I apologize. But um, I, I do want to pet, come back to Chris one, one, um, with one last thought. Chris, um, Anything you can suggest um, as we reach out to you that uh, you guys need in Boston right now? Yeah. That's a tough question. Maybe you don't need much, but we're... I think people just continuing to reach out to us uh, is, is helpful just to know that people care and that, you know, we're staying connected is important during this time. So emails, texts, Google Hangouts, everything, it matters and makes a difference. 
No, thanks for checking in um, tonight um, with us, Chris. That's great. Um, next week, um, we're going to be, uh, Fred Midland is, is doing an art project in California and um, um, and with, uh, what's his name? He was on before. Anyway, um, please ch check in. It's a community school um, art project um, that uh, he's very excited about and, and wants to share with this community here. Um, and then in a couple of weeks, you're going to be planning again, right, Monica, with um, IDEC um, as well. And in between, if you want to come on to TTT with your idea, please let us know. We're uh, way open for that. Um, because we're a community at edtechtalk.com. Um, and um, you can find us at teacherseasonteachers.org. Um, edtechtalk.com is a channel of the World Bridges Network. Thanks to Dave Cormier and Jeff Lebo. Um, for their support over there. Um, Danielle, Amira, Chris, um, Monica, um, Christina, thank you all, um, and we'll see you again soon. Good night. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Good night. Bye.